Good morning, folks. I know there's important stuff going on, but there's can't miss items here today, and I haven't really said that since the other thing began. Let's get to it all, starting at spaceweathernews.com, and we find the last 24 hours on our star doing that same your eyes can deceive you, don't trust them thing we heard Obi say yesterday. We do see the giant coronal hole ready to set an earthquake warning when it turns a bit more, but what's harder to see is that even without sunspots, there is minor flaring in the magnetic fields above the dying active region on the north. Not bad for no umbra. But the top story is in the solar wind. It is dropping out in intensity from what wasn't exactly titanic plasma streams beforehand. We've got 18 hours of KP0 as of this morning, well over 24 hours, less than one average. This chart updates every three hours at spaceweathernews.com, and indeed we're at the high alert range for cosmic rays, as many of you heard through the app notification this morning. The condition presents most strongly as increased alert for high-risk cardiac and mental patients, including cardiopulmonary conditions, unfortunately, for those who can tie that to what's going on in the world. And all biological life is subject to emotional dysregulation and cognitive diminution during these high atomic nuclei bombardment events. Cosmic ray health alerts do extend through a rise in KP index and for about 12 hours thereafter. Let's move on to earthquakes, where the top rumble of the day didn't hit any sort of scary magnitude, but is very much above average there on the eastern side of the Caribbean plate. For those who would like a show tonight, right after sunset, watch Venus chase the sun down the horizon. And then, if you turn around and look to the other side of the sky, the moon is making its closest approach to Earth all year today. Its orbit is slightly eccentric, and with it happening so close to a full moon, what else you got going on tonight? Anyway, moving on. So, you know about isotopes, right? An atom has more or fewer neutrons in the nucleus than the normal stable element. So, with that, you can easily see how two different elements, one of them being an isotope, could have the same number of protons and neutrons total in the nucleus. This is the case for bromine-73 and strontium-73. Different proton numbers, but isotopically balancing neutron numbers to make what scientists believe would be mirror particles, identical in structure, but they are not. And while I am very happy for their discovery and for the giant move forward in nuclear theory, I am curious if anyone watching the show would have guessed that the same nuclear component number isotopes of different elements would look identical, because I wouldn't. Ever. They are different elements entirely. It's literally like you're making an apple pie, and you end up being one apple short of the pie. And so you grab an orange that's the exact same size and say, yeah, that should work. I literally can't believe this was part of science, which again, is why I'm glad it is not anymore. Up next, new Blazar discovered. And normally when they say something is the result of the galactic merger process, I'm like, really? Okay, show me. Oh, that'll work just fine. That is two galactic-sized objects deep into space doing a tango. Now what's incredible is they say that the Blazar jet is brand new, less than 15,000 years old despite their best guess at an interaction period of 500 million years between the galaxies. Remember, blazars, quasars, and radio galaxies are the same things, it's just a classification based on tilt. Well folks, remember that coronal hole earthquake watch we're about to enter? We've got an outstanding preprint today describing the particle flux characteristics from the sun and major earthquakes worldwide. Coronal holes in solar wind sector boundaries are important drivers of these fluctuations and is the reason we've used them for years. By the way, this team absolutely does have access to the seismo electromagnetic satellite data that they co-built with China. There's a reason they did it, because big earthquakes give themselves away electromagnetically and can be triggered by outside energy. Now, last but not least, one of the final great planetary mysteries has been solved. How does Saturn's atmosphere maintain its temperature, and from where does it derive heat? They've long known that the sunlight the planet receives may not satisfy the observable evidence, and now they have zeroed in on the culprit. How about that? Electric currents, particle interactions with the sun, driving aurora, whereby the particles introduced into the atmosphere are not only heating it, but are driving the winds below, and the heating appears to be 200% of what the sunlight is delivering. Of course, not everyone agrees. Al Gore claims it is the Saturnian alien pollution that is holding the heat in and never ever lets it go. Everyone catch what happened there at the giant atmosphere of a planet? Solar wind, electric currents, particle forcing, driving twice the heat of sunlight and forcing the winds below. 
And in what is potentially a related topic, the sun does some stuff here too. Turns out universities have no plans on canceling the fall semesters. They want their textbooks ready to go and ours go to print this week. Pre-order will end up being this month, not next month as we previously anticipated. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got your wind map forecast and shots of our start to close. And of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow, right here. But right now it's 420 AM in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone.